Hello, everyone. I'm Susan Koshi, Director of the Unit for Criticism and Interpretive Theory, and I'd like to welcome you all to this public lecture by Sara Ahmed called Knocking on the Door, Complaints and Other Stories About Institutions. This is the last event of the academic year, and it comes at a time of utter exhaustion, uncertainty, and loss for many of us nor is there a clear ending to any of this. Yet this event carries possibilities we neither anticipated nor planned when I first sent the invitation out to Sara Ahmed. As I watched the registrations increasing day by day, running into the hundreds very quickly from all across the world, from England, Hong Kong, Sweden, Germany, Australia, Korea, India, Pakistan, Canada, I was reminded of the extraordinary reach and power of her work, but also of its resonance in this moment because of what it can make happen, conjuring feminist and queer, queer of color collectives of reflection and activism out of her attunement to affective states and material conditions for we for which we don't yet have names or concepts, but which weigh on us and structure our lives. Her feminist method and queer migrant phenomenology offer vital resources now because her work asks us to stay close to the everyday, to re-see the world through alienation from the world and to delve into the complex, ambivalent and messy feelings that we have as women, queers, minorities, and immigrants. The experience of not being at home in the world, as all her work has shown us, can be the source of knowledge and transformation. Weirdly, the condition of being an affect alien has now become more general, although it remains to be seen what this shift will engender. Her ethnographic work on the university in books like On Being Included, Racism and Diversity in Institutional Life, and in this talk offers a critical lens for thinking about our own institutional lives at a time of staggering changes which have overwhelmed us and which we are still trying to process. I hope that this gathering affords the opportunity to think through these difficulties in the company of others, as we consider the possibilities and difficulties of transforming institutions from within. In that spirit, then, I borrow uh, from Sarah Ahmed's um, dedication in living a feminist life to dedicate this event, quote, to the many feminist killjoys out there doing your thing. This one is for you. Sara Ahmed is an independent feminist scholar and writer. Her work is concerned with how power is experienced and challenged in everyday life and institutional cultures. She has recently completed a book, Complaint, which is forthcoming with Duke University Press in September 2021. Her previous publications include What's the Use on the Uses of Use in 2019, Living a Feminist Life 2017, Willful Subjects 2014, On Being Included 2012, The Promise of Happiness 2010, Queer Phenomenology 2006, The Cultural Politics of Emotion in 2014, 2004, At Strange Encounters 2000, and Differences That Matter 1998. Before I hand it off to Sarah, I want to thank the two graduate assistants, Ashley Ander and Sarah Richter for helping plan and organize this event. I hope it has escaped no one that the Unit for Criticism at Illinois, which has played a key role in the establishment of critical theory in the United States since the 1980s, is now in the hands of three feminist killjoys. Finally, a word about the format for the event. This talk will run for 60 minutes. And after that, we are going to shift to the Q&A with the audience. So for everyone in the audience, 
please use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen to enter in your questions. Um, you just need to click on the tab and type in your questions there. Um, and you don't have to wait until we actually get to the Q&A session to begin to do that. So please type in your questions whenever you're ready with them. Thanks finally to everyone for joining us for this very special event. And here is um, Sarah Ahmed. Thank you so much, Susan. I'm very pleased to be introduced by a feminist Killjoy and for this lecture to be dedicated to all of you Killjoys out there doing your thing. I also wanna thank you for your work in enabling me to speak today and for the opportunity really to share this work with you. So I'm just going to share my screen. So I'll be sharing with you today some stories that have been shared with me about making complaints within universities. My project on complaint is not about all complaints or any complaints. It is about complaints that address abuses of power that confront hierarchies and inequalities. Since I began the research in 2017, well over a hundred people have written to me about their experiences of complaint. Not everyone who got in touch went on to tell me their story. Sometimes getting in touch can be telling enough. One academic wrote, I want the story to go somewhere apart from round and round in my head, which is why I'm contacting you. When a story goes round and round in your head, it can feel like a lot of movement, not to get very far. So my task in this project is to become a feminist ear to give these stories of complaint somewhere to go. You, in being there as an audience, thank you for being there, will also become feminist ears. You too will be giving these stories of complaint somewhere to go. I need you to know before I share these stories that some of them include details and descriptions of assault, as well as harassment and bullying. These are difficult stories to share, I'm aware they may be difficult to hear, so please do take care of yourselves in listening to them. If my book on complaint is about complaints at the university, my book is also on the university. And by on the university, I do not just mean that the university is my research site, although it is that. I also mean that the project is about the effort to transform universities. I was inspired to do this work by my experience of supporting students who made a collective complaint about sexual misconduct and sexual harassment where I used to work. Leela Whitley, Tiffany Page, Alice Corball, with support from Heidi Hasbrook, Chris Sudrolia, and others wrote one of the two conclusions for the book itself about the work they began as students to write about the work is to continue the work. And I want to thank each of them, all of them for that work. In the book, I'm also deeply indebted to the critiques of diversity and the university offered by black feminists and feminists of color, such as Jackie Alexander, Selma Bilga, Heidi Mirza, Chandra Tape Mahanti, Melinda Smith, Shirley Antate, and Gloria Vecca. I think of their combined work as counter-institutional. They teach us how universities work, for whom they work, for whom they don't work. Counter-institutional work in feminist hands is often housework with all the drudgery and repetition that that word implies, painstaking work, administrative work, also care work, because if we need to transform institutions to survive them, we still need to survive the institutions we are trying to transform. To make complaints within institutions is to learn about them, to learn what I think of as institutional mechanics. So much of the work of complaint, and we'll hear tonight that complaint is work, is hidden because of where complaints happen. They happen behind closed doors. So to be a feminist ear is also to put your ear to the door, to listen to the door, as well as through 
the door. I needed to find a way to share what I could hear in complaint from complaint whilst keeping confidences. So that's offer fragments from many different stories. A fragment is a sharp piece of something. A complaint can be a shattering, like a broken jug, we can be left in pieces. And I'll be picking up some of these pieces today, trying to learn from the sharpness of each. A fragment of a story, a fragment as a story, how do we tell such stories? It can be hard to know where to begin a story of complaint because it's hard to know when a complaint begins. Let me share the opening words from a testimony offered by a senior researcher who made a complaint about bullying and harassment. It is always so complex and so difficult and so upsetting still, even just knowing where the start is. And it's funny, even just starting, I can feel emotion coming out and all I want to do is I want to start crying. And I'm also going to have to present a good front, professional and corrected and no, I just can't let it affect me. And I'm going to have to talk about this as something that is detached. And I think, why am I putting so much effort into presenting something that is so much part of me? Emotion comes out in telling the story. Emotion makes it hard to tell the story. You make an effort to present something because it has become part of you, because it matters to you, to what you can do and who you can be. But how it matters makes it hard to present. From this one fragment, we hear how to tell the story of a complaint is also to reflect on what it means and how it feels to tell that story, to bring into the present time an experience that is shattering. The data is experiential. The data is theoretical. A complaint can be an expression of grief, pain or dissatisfaction, something that is a cause of protest or outcry, a bodily ailment or a formal allegation. So if in the research I began with this latter sense of complaint as formal allegation, I also show how this latter sense brings up these other more affective and embodied senses. A complaint can heighten your senses. One lecturer describes, it's a bit like if you complain, you get extra vision. It is suddenly like you can see in extra violet and you can't go back. You can see what you did not see before. You can see more and you cannot unsee what you have come to see. And getting to that point, the complainer, you never shed it. It is like the problem child. Having done it, you can't go back. A complaint becomes part of you, part of who you become, that problem child. You can't shed it. You can't shed her. Perhaps it is a promise. Having become a complainer, you cannot unbecome a complainer. But promises don't always feel promising. That a complaint can take over your life, even become your life, even become you, can be what makes complaint so exhausting. So to tell the story of a complaint can be to tell a life story. And to tell the story of a complaint made within an institution can be to tell another kind of story about the institution, a story that counters the story the institution tends to tell of itself and about itself. On paper, this is the institution's story of complaint. A complaint might appear rather like this. It's a flowchart with straight lines and pointy arrows giving the would-be complainer a route through. I look at this complaints procedure and I also see diversity Diversity is papering over the cracks. Diversity as smoothing out an appearance. But even complaints that assume at some point the form of a formal complaint do not start with the use of a procedure. The work of complaint begins long before that. What a complaint is about tends to precede the complaint, although what precedes the complaint is often ongoing. So if you cannot go back to who you were before a complaint, a complaint still requires that you go back. You have to go back over what is not over. A lecturer is returning after long-term sick leave. 
she is neurodivergent who needs time and space to return to work and to do her work. In having to fight for what she needed, she came to realize she had a complaint or grievance. I wasn't just a person who was off sick. I was a person who had a grievance against the way I had been treated at the university. The complaint takes up more and more of her time. She describes, there are like four channels of complaint going on at the same time. But interestingly, none of these people seem to be crossing over. You duplicate the complaint at different times, emails, phone calls, occupational health, the union, it is all being logged. It is generating all this material and all this paperwork, but actually nothing seems to shift. It's just a file, actually. I'll return to how complaints end up in or as files later. So she has to keep making the same complaint to different people because those people are not speaking to each other. So if we were to picture a complaint from the complainer's point of view, it would be less of a flow, flow, away we go, and rather more like this. It's a mess, it's a tangle. If you can get in, you can't work out how to get out. All these conversations, all this paperwork, all this material, you end up with so many dead ends, so many crossed wires. And despite all of that, nothing seems to shift. So let me share with you her description of what it feels like to do this work. It was like a little bird scratching away at something and it wasn't really having any effect. It was just really small, small, small and behind closed doors. I think people maybe feel that because of the nature of the complaint and you're off work, so they have to be polite and not talk about it. And so much of their politeness is because they don't want to say something. And maybe it is to do with being in an institution and the way they are built, long corridors, doors with locks on them, windows of blinds that come down, it seems to sort of imbue every part of it with a cloistered feeling. There is no air, it feels suffocating. It was like, note this yet, a complaint is something you are doing can acquire exteriority, becoming a thing in the world, scratching away a little bird, all your energy going into an activity that matters so much to what you can do, and who you can be but barely seems to leave a trace the more you try the smaller it becomes the smaller you become smaller and smaller still i think of those little birds scratching away and i also think of diversity work described to me by one practitioner as a banging your head against a brick wall job if the wall keeps its place it is you that gets sore and what happens to the wall all you seem to have done is scratch the surface. And that's what diversity work often feels like, scratching the surface. And complaint two, that little bird scratching away at something. So scratching gives you a sense of the limits of what you can accomplish. Notice well that a complaint becomes like a magnifying glass. So much appears, so many details are being picked up by an attention, the geography of a place, the building, the long corridors the locked doors, the windows of blinds that come down, less light, less room, you cannot breathe, it feels suffocating. So when you have to fight for room, you can become conscious of just what little room you have. I was struck by how often doors came up in her testimony, she mentions them seven times, to be precise, as well as in the testimony of others. She describes, I was just frightened, and I just allowed myself to go through it very privately. And I hit all those doors along the way and just came out very guarded by it. The doors closed on the complaint, keeping it private, can be the same doors that stop the complaint. So that there are so many doors in these stories is telling us something. We are more likely to notice the doors when we hit them rather than enter them. Doors are not just physical things that swing on hinges, though they are that. They are also the mechanisms that enable an opening or a closing. So when a path is no longer available to us, a door becomes a figure of speech. We say that door is closed. So doors can be, to borrow from Audrey Lord, the master's tools, teaching us how the same house is being built, how only some can enter, how others become trespassers. You can hit doors before you even make a complaint. 
a postgraduate student is being harassed by her supervisor. She's a queer woman of colour. She's from a working class background. She's the first person in her family to go to university. She's had to fight really hard to get here. She's had to fight really hard to get here. I repeated that sentence because of how it matters, because of how much it matters. But she knows something is not right. She's feeling more and more uncomfortable. He keeps pushing boundaries, wanting to meet off campus, then in coffee shops, then at his house. She tries to handle the situation. I try very hard to keep all of the meetings on campus and to keep the door open. She keeps the door open, an actual door. At the same time as she closes another kind of door, we might call this door the door of consciousness. She describes, I thought I would take myself down by admitting to the kind of violence he was enacting. Take myself down to admit to violence can feel like becoming your own killjoy getting in the way of your own progression. To admit can mean to confess a truth as well as to let something in. So note how doors can hold a contradiction. Keeping the office door open is an admission of a truth that she handles by not letting it in. But handles can stop working. I was sitting with, with another colleague at another lunch another day, and he started texting me these naked photos of himself. And I think it just hit a, crit a critical mass of like, I just can't handle it anymore. And my friend I was sitting with, I just said, look at this. And she was just completely speechless. And then it suddenly started to seep into me, into her, in the shared conversation about how horrible and violent that I'm having to receive these things, right? And so that basically put a process in motion when she can't handle it. The violence directed at her seeks not only into her, but into her colleague, into the conversation, into the room in which they are having that conversation. When the violence gets in, the complaint comes out. But of course, it takes more than letting violence in to get the complaint out, because to get it out, you also have to get it through the institution. So what does she do? She goes to the office responsible for handling complaints. They were like, you could file a complaint, but he's really well loved by the university. He has a strong publication record. You were gonna go through all of this emotional torment. It was even proposed that he could counter sue me for defamation of character. The line was essentially, you can do this, but why would you? You can do this, but why would you? Many of those who indicate an intent to complain are stopped from doing so by the use of warnings. A warning is telling you that a complaint will have dire consequences, that to complain will be to hurtle toward a miserable fate. A warning can be a reminder of precarity, of what you need, who you need to proceed, or what you could lose because of what you need and who you need. So warnings about complaint can take the form of what I call institutional fatalism, statements about what institutions are like as what institutions will be, they will be what they will be, as who they will love, as who they will protect. So in the end, she did not file a formal complaint because she knew what she was being told, that she wouldn't get anywhere, that it wouldn't get anywhere because he was going somewhere. If you open the door of consciousness only to be stopped by the doors of the institution, the violence that seeps into you stays in you, slow, heavy, down. So you have to then work out how to keep doing your work. I talked informally to a woman professor about complaints she did and did not make. She attends a meeting for senior managers. She's the only woman around the table, but she is used to this. This is business as usual. The usual is the structural in temporal form. Sometimes not attending to something, letting it recede from consciousness, becoming part of the background, can be a sign of just how much we've already taken in. But then one of the men at the table makes a sexualizing comment about chasing a woman around the dark room. She described how the comment became a bonding moment between men, how the atmosphere in the room changed, laughter, interest, as if they'd all been brought to attention. Even when you're used to it, 
it can still hit you, that wall, sexism, heterosexism, that is bubbling away at the surface of so many encounters. She did not say anything. She did not do anything. After expressing her feelings to me of rage, alienation, disappointment, and also of sadness, she said, you file it under, don't go there. And I think that is what some of us do to keep doing our work. We file away what is hardest to handle, creating our own complaint files. The file don't go there tells us where we have been. A complaint file can be filled with the complaints that we have, but do not make, that we do not express. The more we contain ourselves, our complaints, our histories, the more there is to come out. A junior woman lecturer is being sexually harassed by a senior man professor, mainly through constant verbal communication. He, he emailed her about wanting to suck her toes. She thought she had handled this by making an informal complaint. She asked her line manager, her superior, her head of department say, to ask him to stop. She explains, I just want someone to have a chat with him and say, please don't continue with this. And she assured me that she would do that. Her line manager did not do that. Some complaints are stopped, not by warnings that say, no, don't go there, don't do that. But rather by assurances, by yeses or nods that create the impression, the impression can be the point, that a complaint is being dealt with. She learns later why her line manager did not say or do anything. Much later I learned because she did not want to complain, nothing happened. If to pass a complaint on is to make the complaint, a complaint might not be passed on because the person who receives it doesn't want to make it. She added, there is a cost to saying these things, there's a cost to having that conversation. So a complaint might not be passed on, given that to pass on a complaint can also be to pass on the costs of complaint. So the failure to pass a complaint on might tell us something about how complaints are perceived. Complaints are treated as contagious, as catchy, as well as costly. The sociability of complaint, how many people are involved in getting complaints through or getting them out is as key to understanding blockages. When an attempt to stop harassment is stopped, the harassment does not stop. And then I was in a meeting with my line manager and her line manager, and we were in this little office space, like a glass fishbowl type meeting room. And then the main office where all the staff desks were, and he emailed me and I made a sound, Ugh, there's no way to articulate it. Someone's just dragging your insides like a meat grinder. Oh God, this is not going to stop. And I made that sound out loud. And my line manager's line manager said, what's happened and I turned my computer around and showed him and he said for fuck's sake how stupid do you have to be to put that in an email he could see a look of panic on her face like crap this is not magically gone away that sound that ah pierces the meeting that meeting taking place in the little glass room that fish bar where they can all be seen so something can become visible and audible sometimes even despite yourself a complaint is what comes out when you can't take it anymore, you just can't take it anymore. Your insides like a meat grinder. A complaint is how you're turned inside out. And note how the problem once heard is implied to be not so much the harassment, but that there was evidence of it. For fuck's sake, how stupid do you have to be to put that in an email? So a sound can become a complaint. When it brings to the surface a violence, that would otherwise not have to be faced. Remember those windows of blinds that come down. Violence is often dealt with by not being faced. It can then take a complaint, not necessarily understood as an intentional action, but as a sound or alert to raise the blind, to bring the violence that is in the room out. There is so much to come out in these stories, so much leakage, so much seepage, because of how much we have to contain. A senior lecturer has been bullied by her head of department over many years. She attends a meeting. 
So then he started to yell and I stood up. You go out of the office and then to the left is a little passageway to the door. So I went up to the front door and it has two locks that you have to turn in two different directions. And I had all my bags on me and then up behind me came a pair of hands and pulled my hands off the lock. He then wrapped his arms around me and so I was constrained with my arms on my sides. And then he suddenly he let go and he had this look in his face like exasperation, like I had been a naughty child. And I didn't know what to do. I thought if I tried to go to the front door again, he may grab me again. The lock that turns in two different directions, it's hard to know which way it turns, which way to turn. The hands that come up, pulling her hands off the lock, the lock becoming a hand, a hand, a lock, what stops her from getting out. She does get out, but it was hard. And what then? What to do then? She submits a complaint. And she does so in part as her university had invested a great deal of time and energy in developing new policies and complaints procedures. She makes a complaint as she thought those policies and procedures meant what they stated, only to learn they did not. In fact, when you complain, you often learn what policies are not meant. Another lecturer describes, that was my experience of the complaint process. As an employer of the university, the minute you try to enact policy, it is a tripwire. The policies are not meant. A tripwire, that's another kind of alarm or alert, <coughs> something like that. So you can be stopped from using the policy to do something. I would add to do what the policy was meant to do, rather like a trespasser is stopped from entering the building. So what happens when the senior lecturer made the complaint about being bullied and indeed assaulted by her head of department? He is suspended during a formal inquiry. And what does the inquiry find? In the report, he is described as having a direct style of management. He is cleared of wrongdoing. In fact, the assault itself is described as on par with a handshake. On par with a handshake, on par equals equal. So a physical assault can be turned into a friendly greeting. The violence of an action can be removed by how an action is described, which means that description can be a blind. It is not that the blinds stop violence from being seen. Those blinds come down because violence is seen. She also said they kept saying that they had a duty of care to protect him as head department. The word protect comes from cover, to cover up, to cover over, and giving him cover, the violence is covered over. If an assault is turned into a handshake, friendly, like, it is she who is deemed unfriendly and she is called repeatedly uncollegial. He remains in post, she is moved to another department. So when violence is covered over or shut in, those who complain are shut out. It's very important to add here that violence is not just covered over by institutions through the very form of their response, but also often by colleagues. I think of one senior woman academic who considered making a complaint about the conduct of a professor, a star professor. He was the most esteemed professor at her university. She wanted to make a complaint about sexism and misogyny. When she told a colleague about what the professor had said and done, the colleague responded, you must have imagined that because he's married to a real feminist. Another said similarly, hey, she wouldn't put up with that. That can't be right. She knows what happened. She knows she's right. She knows men who are married to real feminists can be sexist and misogynist. She knows, I think, that they know. And so she realizes that it's not just the university who is invested in him, the star professor, although the university is and was, it is also his colleagues, who are her colleagues, their colleagues. They don't want to know. So collegiality can be not only a bond and a bind, but also a blind. So much violence is not seen because people want to preserve an attachment. And that attachment can also be investment to complain is to encounter a wall of investment. When people benefit from relationships with colleagues who are abusive, they often minimize the abuse. 
to keep the benefits. This is why to complain can be to see so much. You see what is pulled over what you see. And this is why to complain is to learn how spaces remain occupied. In my book, What's the Use? I use this image as an image of queer use, how spaces can be used in ways that were not intended or by those for whom they were not intended. I think of the birds rather affectionately as our queer kin. They turn a small opening intended for letters into a door, a queer door perhaps, a way of getting in and out of a box. Of course, the postbox can only become a nest if it stops being used as a postbox, hence the sign, please don't use, addressed to would-be posters of letters. I'm aware this is a rather happy and hopeful image, perhaps not typical for a feminist killjoy to show. It is in fact rare that we can just turn up and turn a box into a nest or a room into a shelter to queer use, to enable some to take up residence in spaces not intended for them, often requires a world dismantling effort. And in listening to complaint, I'm hearing about that effort. A complaint can be necessary to enter a room that has not been built for you. A disabled academic describes how she has to keep pointing out that the rooms are inaccessible because they keep booking rooms that are inaccessible. She has to keep saying it because they keep doing it. I worry about drawing attention to myself, but this is what happens when you hire a person in a wheelchair. There have been major access issues at the university. She spoke of the drain, the exhaustion, the sense of why should I have to be the one who speaks out? You have to speak out because others do not. And because you speak out, others can justify their silence. They hear you. So it becomes about you. Major access issues become your issues. So structures get turned into issues, made personal. You can't get in. The problem is you. Those of us who have issues often end up on the diversity committee. The more issues we have, the more committees we end up on. But those committees can still end up being occupied in the same old ways. And one of Colour Academic describes, I was on the Equality and Diversity Group in the university. And as soon as I started mentioning things to do with race, they changed a the portfolio of who could be on the committee and I was dropped. You just have to say the word race and you'll be heard as complaining. You also might be more likely to be complained about. Another time she is writing a paper for a special issue of a journal on decolonizing her discipline, she receives feedback from a white editor. The response of the editor was, needs to be toned down, not enough scholarly input to back up the claims they're making. Basically, get back in your box and if you want to decolonize, we'll do it on our terms. Being dropped for the diversity committee for mentioning things to do with race, race that, that complaint holder or complaint folder is continuous with being told to tone it down on the decolonizing special issue. So whiteness can be just as occupying of issues or spaces when they're designated as decolonial. I sometimes call this decolonial whiteness. So what happens if you raise issues on these issues? She describes, whenever you raise something, the response is, you're not one of them. You're not one of them. A complaint seems to amplify what makes you not fit, picking up on what you are not. A complainer becomes a foreigner, a stranger, a trespasser, not from here, not really from here, not. A complaint then can be used as evidence that you are not from here or that you do not belong here. A PhD student objects to how a lecturer communicates with her. He is overly intimate. He had sent her an email from a private Hotmail account and suggested that they meet up during this or that weekend in the evening. She communicates to him that she found his style of communication to be inappropriate. This is his response written in an email. As for meeting in the evening and its combination with my email, this is how we do it here at the department, ask our MA students. Perhaps your department has some other norm, which I do not understand. Also, your religion might be a problem. So note the assertion of how we do things here as an answer to a questioning of how he is doing things here. We are back to that institutional fatalism, history as inheritance. Note also the interpolation of other students into that assertion. And note how her religion, she's from a Muslim background, is used to explain her objection. A complaint 
can be explained away, you can be explained away. The suggestion that a complaint might be an expression of a difference of norms has much to teach us. Those who complain are often treated as imposing norms upon others, as attempting to stop them from expressing themselves freely. It's important to note here that harassment and bullying are often treated as styles of communication. Remember that direct style of management? I have even heard of sexual assaults being dismissed and described as styles of communication. So one academic who had multiple complaints against him from students, including for rape and domestic violence, was described in a letter written on behalf, on his behalf by a colleague as a rough diamond. Blunt speech, a rough diamond, direct style of management. So unsurprisingly then, those who make complaints about harassment or bullying often end up the object of counter complaints. I communicated informally with a woman academic who made a complaint against a colleague for academic misconduct and bullying. She decides to make a formal complaint when she found out that a number of students were putting in complaints against him, some for sexual misconduct, some for bullying. But the university, in accordance with its own policies and procedures, treated each of these complaints separately. The atomization of complaints procedures is how data is not shared, it's how power remains unseen. So when he submits a counter complaint against her, his complaint gets uptake. He is protected, he describes. I think what's interesting in my case is the way that the Equality Act was leveraged against me, e.g. he claimed I was the bully. The fluffy terminology of university policies, if they feel upset at his bullying, was used to his favour here. He went off work sick with depression and anxiety, which was used as proof of how my bullying affected him, rather than the fact that he was depressed and anxious about having multiple women file complaints about him, the emotional impact of which for him doesn't make the complaints wrong. It was like his distress was worth so much more than mine because mine were cheap female emotions. The whole thing felt so misogynistic. This is a very powerful description of a very old problem. The technologies we have available to challenge abuses of power from complaints procedures to anti-discrimination policies to equality and diversity policies to the very languages of harm and oppression can be used to abuse power. So a bully with a complaints procedure is a bully with another weapon. Power is also the ability to influence how we are received. So when some people matter more, their feelings matter more, his distress was worth so much more than mine. You do not need to complain about not being taken more seriously if you are taken more seriously. But if those who are taken more seriously complain, then their complaints are taken more seriously. This is the significance of imminence. That some complaints get uptake reproduces the very problem that other complaints are made to redress. So then to try to redress the problem is to become a problem, which is why the complainer often is complained about. One way or another way, you end up under interrogation. A trans student of colour makes a complaint about sexual harassment and transphobic harassment from their supervisor who kept asking them deeply intrusive questions about their gender and genitals. Questions can be hammering for some to be, is to be in question. These questions were laced in the language of concern for the welfare of the student predicated on judgments that they would be endangered if they conducted their research in their home country. Racist judgments are often about the location of danger over there in a black or brown elsewhere. Transphobic judgments are often about the location of danger in here, in the body of a trans person, as if to be trans is to incite the violence against you. When they complain what happens, they said, people were just trying to evaluate whether he was right to believe there would be some sort of physical danger to me because of my gender identity, as if to say he was right to be concerned. The same intrusive questions that led you to complain are asked because you complain. So much harassment today is enacted as a right to be concerned. We have a right to be concerned about immigration as citizens. We have a right to be concerned about sex-based rights as adult human females and so on. A right to be concerned is how violence is enacted. A violence premise on suspicion that some are not who they say they are, that some have no right to be where they are, 
to be as they say they are, that some have no right to be. There are so many ways we can be shut out from institutions, from categories of personhood, from ourselves even. One woman of colour described her department as a revolving door. Women and minorities in her terms enter only to head right out again, whoosh, whoosh. You can be kept out by what you find out when you get in or getting in can be how you're shown this way out. And yet consider how often diversity is imagined as an open door turned into a tagline, tag along, tag on. Minorities welcome, come in, come in. Just because they welcome you doesn't mean they expect you to turn up. Remember that post box that became a nest? There could have been another sign on the post box, birds welcome. Diversity is that sign. The sign would be non-performative, empty of force, if the post box was still in use, because the birds would be dislodged by the letters, a nest destroyed before it could be created. Those comments tone it down, different ways you're told this is not your box, get back into your own box, being asked questions, what are you? Where are you from? Where are you ready from? They function as the letters in the box, they pile up until there's no room left, no room to nest, to breathe, to be. We learn then that occupation and dispossession are achieved by the same materials. So much violence is made immaterial, small, insignificant, on par with a handshake, the door is open, come in, come in. That's why it's not enough to open a door or even to appear welcoming. And so if diversity is that sign, diversity covers over the materiality of dispossession. For some to be in the room requires stopping what usually happens in the room, otherwise they would be, as it were, displaced by the letters in the box. So a complaint can be the effort to stop what usually happens from happening. An Indigenous student makes a complaint about white supremacy in her classroom. She describes, you start seeing these patterns and I wanted to start questioning them, you know, white supremacy in the classroom, white privilege in the classroom that's not being called out or tackled, constructions of Indigenous people in the classroom that are very colonial. So she sends a letter to the professor. And what does the professor do? She describes, I told him what the issues were I said I wouldn't be able to come back into the classroom until these matters were addressed. He never responded to me. He never responded to me, but I got a phone call the next day from one of the women on the call. She said the professor came to class today and he read out the email you wrote about us. So rather than respond to her, the Indigenous student who called it out, the professor prints out her letter and reads it out to the class, the same class she's complaining about, without her permission. I think of what he is expressing in doing that. She is complaining about what is taken from her. White supremacy is the theft of the very possibility of her being in that space. And then her complaint is taken from her, turned into another way he expresses himself. She does not return to the class. So I think again to that post box. In writing that complaint, she was trying to stop the same thing from being posted, white supremacy as occupying of space. But the letter ends up being what is posted. So a complaint about the letters in the box becomes another letter in the box. All it takes is what usually happens to happen for the person who complains to end up being displaced, which can feel like, and can feel like this, perhaps it is this, being displaced by your own complaint. There are so many ways we can be displaced, shut out, including by the very appearance of an open door or of a welcome. People of colour are often assumed to enter the diversity door, that open door, however we enter. And that door can be shut at any point. That door can be shut to stop us getting in, or that door can be shut because we get in. A black woman academic was being racially harassed and bullied by a white woman who was her head department. I had put down that I would like to, work, like to work towards becoming a professor and she just laughed in my face. That laughter can be the sound of a door being slammed. Some of us in becoming professors become trespassers. You are being told you need permission to enter by being told you do not have permission. Closed doors can mean that other people do not hear that laughter 
they don't hear the door being slammed. And those who try to stop you from progressing or a complaint from progressing can be the same people who front the institution, perhaps nodding enthusiastically about diversity. Nod, nod, yes, yes, slam. I'm listening to an Indigenous woman academic. She told me she could barely get to campus after a sustained campaign of bullying and harassment from white faculty, including a concerted effort by a senior manager to sabotage her tenure case, as well as a tenure case of other Indigenous academics. When you are harassed and bullied, when doors are closed and they slammed, making it hard to get anywhere, it can be history you are up against, thrown up against. So complaints in taking us back, take us back further and further still to histories that are still. There's a genealogy of experience, a genealogy of consciousness in my body that is now at this stage traumatized beyond the capacity to go to the university. So there's a legacy of genealogy and I haven't really opened that door too widely as I've been so focused on my experience in the last seven years. To be traumatized is to hold a history in a body that can be easily shattered. There is only so much you can take on because there's only so much you can take in. Earlier, I used the expression the door of consciousness to describe how we sometimes shut violence out, perhaps because it's too difficult to deal with, perhaps to hold on to something we fear losing, perhaps in order to focus or to function. We can inherit closed doors. A trauma can be inherited by being made inaccessible, all that has happened that was too hard or too painful to reveal. Decolonial feminist work, black feminist work, feminist of color work is often about opening these doors, the door to what came before, colonial as well as patriarchal legacies, harassment as a hardening of that history, a history of who gets to do what, of who is deemed entitled to what, of who is deemed entitled to whom. So a complaint can be necessary, what you have to do to go on, but you still have to work out what you can take on. And she went on by taking them on. I took everything off my door, my posters, my activism, my pamphlets. I smudged everything all around the building. I knew I was going to war. I did a war ritual in our tradition. I pulled down the curtain. I pulled on a mask. My people, we have a mask and I never opened my door for a year. I just said it'd be a crack. Not only my students could come in, I would not let a single person come into my office. Why well, not already invited there for a whole year? Closing a door can sometimes be a survival strategy. She closes the door to the institution by withdrawing herself and her commitments from it. She still does her work. She still teaches her students. She uses the door to shut out what she can and who she can. She takes herself off the door. She depersonalizes it. And she pulls down the blinds and she pulls on a mask, the mask of her people connecting her fight to the battles that came before, because quite frankly, for her, this is a war. This is a war. Our battles are not the same battles, but there are many battles happening behind closed doors. Behind closed doors, that is where complaints are often found. So that is where you might find us too, those of us for whom the institution is not built and what we bring with us, who we bring with us, the worlds that would not be here if some of us were not here. The data we hold, our bodies, our memories. Perhaps the more we have to spill, the tighter the hold. The more we have to spill. So many complaints end up in filing cabinets to file as to file away. One student said of a complaint, it just gets shoved in the box. Another student describes, I feel like my complaint has gone into the complaint graveyard. When a complaint is filed away or binned or buried, those who complain can end up feeling filed away or been or buried. But we also sense them how much filing cabinets can matter because so much of ourselves, our histories can be buried here. So if the work of complaint is how some of those materials end up here, the work of complaint is also about how we get the materials out of here. A disabled student was not getting anywhere with her complaint about the failure of the university to make reasonable accommodations. And then a file suddenly appears, a, a load of documents turned up on the students' union's fax machine. We don't know where they came from. They were like historical docu documents about students who had to leave. The documents included a handwritten letter to a human rights charity by a former student who had cancer and who was trying to get the university to allow her to finish her degree part-time. 
The student I spoke to speculates that a secretary was doing their own little bit of direct action by releasing those documents as a way of supporting her complaint that she was not supposed to support. The word secretary derives from secrets. The secretary is the keeper of secrets. So it's not surprising that a secretary can become a saboteur, institutional work, housework. The secretary knows where the stuff is. She knows what to do to get it out. I think of the student who wrote that letter by hand. We can't know, we won't know what happened to her, but that she wrote the letter mattered. She matters. If the student I spoke to hadn't made her complaint, that file would have stayed put, the letter to dusty and buried. So a complaint in the present can be how information from the past is released and we can meet in an action without meeting in person. Sometimes then to get the materials out, we get out. When I made the reasons for my own resignation public, I shared information, not very much, but enough that there had even been these inquiries and I became a leak, drip, drip. The university responded in the mode of damage limitation, treating the information as a mess. Diversity is often about damage limitation. But there is hope here because they cannot mop up all of that mess. A leak can be a lead. By becoming a leak, it became easier to find. People came to me with their complaints. That we find each other through complaint is a finding. Posting that letter was how I became part of a collective, a complaint collective we are assembled before you. One lecturer who left the complaint after her, left the academy after her complaint did not get anywhere. It was she who likened complaint to a little bird scratching away at something, turned her resignation letter into a performance. I wrote a two page letter and it was really important to me to put everything in there that I felt so that it was down on paper. And then I asked for a meeting with the Dean. I kind of read the letter out in a performative kind of way just to have some kind of event. We find ways to make our letters matter. She still wanted to do more. She wanted to put her letter on the wall. In other words, to get the complaint from behind the door right onto the wall where others would see it. I just thought, I'm not the kind of person who will put my resignation letter on the wall, but I just wonder what it is that made me feel that I'm not that kind of person because inside I am that kind of person. I just couldn't quite get it out. Perhaps that's what complaints are about, how we help each other to get it out. I think again of those scratches on the wall. They seemed at first to show the limits of what we can accomplish. They can also be what we leave behind. They can be testimony. So what appears as scratches, as scribble, those scramble of letters that uh, can be how we get our complaints on the wall. Scratching on the wall. The sound of labor knocking on the door. I hear Audre Lord knocking on the door, telling us something's up. In an interview with Adrian Rich, Lord describes her fascination with the poem, The Listener, a poem about a traveler who rides a horse up to the door of an apparently empty house. This is the poem in Lord's words. He knocks at the door and nobody answers. Is there anybody there, he said, and he has a feeling that there really is somebody in there. And then he turns his horse and he says, tell them I came and nobody answered that I kept my word. I used to recite that poem to myself all the time. It was one of my favorites. And if you'd asked me, what is it about? I don't think I could have told you, but this was the first cause of my own writing, my need to say things I couldn't say otherwise when I couldn't find other poems to serve. It is important to follow Lord, to go where she goes. When we are fascinated by something, we do not always know why. Law keeps reciting the poem. She says it imprinted on her. I think of that imprint, the print of a poem on a person. Knock, that can be the sound of an imprint. The point is not in the answer, whether somebody answers, but in the knock. The knock is the action. Remember, we can meet in an action without meeting in person. To keep your word is to turn up. It is to keep turning up, to find new forms of expression. You might be knocking on the door of consciousness. That door can be an inheritance. Trying to hear something, to admit what has been shut out, the violence that has been made inaccessible. Or you might be knocking on the door of the master's house because you know that house is haunted. 
knocking is hard. Knocking is how we learn that the door of consciousness that shuts violence out can be the same door used by institutions to shut violence in. How the data of complaint, our data, our truths ends up under lock and key to knock on that door, to make that sound not knock, knock who is there, but knock, knock, we are here, is to cause a disturbance, to disturb the spirits who linger here because of the violence that has not been dealt with. Knock, knock, rattle, rattle. I hear Aileen Morton Robinson, who describes how Indigenous sovereignty continues in the presence of Indigenous people and their land, haunting the house that Jack built, shaking its foundations, rattling the picket fence. Knock, knock, rattle, rattle. A rattling can be a refusal. The refusal of Indigenous people to disappear can shake the foundations. A refusal to disappear, survival as complaint. There cannot not be ghosts in these stories, ghosts, graveyards and haunting, because we are dealing with what has not been dealt with. Perhaps we are the ghosts, brown and black people, in white institutions, indigenous people, in a settler colonial institutions. If we are the ghosts, we too are haunted by them, by what is not gone, by what goes on. The complaints in the graveyard can come back to haunt institutions. We can come back to haunt institutions. I shared the image of a complaint graveyard of one person that had been shared with me by another. She said, you have to think about the impact of doing this because having yet another complaint, it means that you give more credibility to the one who comes after you. When you talk about haunting, you are talking about the size of the graveyard. And I think this is important because when you have one tombstone, one lone little ghost, it doesn't actually have any effect. You can have a nice cute little cemetery outside your window. But when you start having a massive one, common graveyards and so on, it becomes something else. It becomes much harder to manage. We can and do form complaint collectives. We can and do become harder to manage, but we do not always assemble at the same time or in the same place. Can I address you now? <laughs> you might feel like a lonely little ghost right now. Your complaint might seem to have evaporated like steam, puff, puff but your complaint can still be picked up by others, by the one who comes after, who can receive something from you because of what you tried to do, even though you did not get through, even though all you seemed to do was scratch the surface. Even complaints that we do not make can be picked up. After all, complaints we do not make, we file that file that says, don't go there, that says where we have been, that file, can become a collective. Unmade complaints might end up in the complaint graveyard too. Little ghosts, less lonely for getting there, less lonely for being there. There you are doing what you do. Little ghosts, little birds scratching away at something, trying to create room and nest out of what has been left scattered. Little ghosts, little birds, a common graveyard, a queer nest. Even when complaint leads to institutional death, to complain is to give support to life. You plant something in saying no, by saying no, the twists and turns of new growth. To make a nest possible, to make it possible to nest, you have to stop what usually happens from happening. You have to stop those letters from being posted, from piling up, from taking up space. The work of making possible is the work of complaint. You can't always tell, you don't always know what a complaint makes possible. But from complaint, we learn how possibility is not plucked out of thin air. Possibility comes from intimacy with what has thickened over time. You might be chipping away at that old block, those structures, that wall, and all you seem to have done is scratch the surface. But that scratching is also learning. We learn about structures from how they are justified. The more we complain, the more they have to justify. I think of a vice, vice chancellor, who said in response to a questioning of the use of the name of eugenicist on a building, my only defense is I inherited him. The more we question how things are, the more we know how things are, institutional fatalism, history as inheritance, reader, I inherited him. And you know what? We know what. Arguments can stop working. Justifications can become tired. The inevitable turns out to be avoidable. We cannot always perceive the weakening of structures until they begin to collapse. When structures begin to collapse, 
the impact of past efforts is becoming tangible. So if compliance can participate in the weakening of structures without that impact being tangible, to say no, to scramble the letters, they don't pile up, they don't make sense, is to fight against something, what is tight, what is narrow, to create room for something else, for somebody else. It just takes a small opening, a crack even, for so much and for so many to come out. A complaint can open the door to those who came before. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, um, Sarah. Um, I'm just going to uh, uh, open yeah. the, the door behind me, if you don't mind, everybody, uh, to make sure that my dogs, if they need to, can come in. So I will just turn off my video for like a second, or maybe okay. 30 seconds, and then I will be back. Um, in the meantime, um, we already have questions coming in. So I'd encourage um, everyone uh, who would like to ask a question, just hit the Q&A tab and enter in your questions. Um, it's good to have so many of you here and to see so much activity in the chat as well as um, in the Q&A tab. Um, uh, it doesn't happen often, but um, you know, just in the middle of the lecture, I've been bombarded by emails from colleagues. Um, and I'm just to give you a sense of, you know, how wonderful this event is for so many of us. Um, I have a colleague who's written in to say, oh, wow, Sara, <laughs> do you want to close the door? <laughs> um, are you leaving the door open? I, uh, yes, I am. So my little dog's going to come in. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> she's going to help me answer the questions <laughs> okay okay well I'll just re read your comment from a colleague of mine sent over email it's um okay sorry <laughs> okay no problem um so the comment is oh wow just wow the intelligence the sensitivity the way she reads explains performs so fantastic thank you oh thank you thank <laughs> you <Okay. laughs> Okay, so um, do you need a few more minutes or do you, are you okay? Do you want no, to? we're all set. We're all set. Okay. All right. Um, so I'm opening up the Q&A tab and um, got a lot of questions. So uh, let's start. Okay. Um, the first one is from Luisa Melo. And the question is, I was wondering how much uh, in terms of percentage of those who complain actually finish their degrees. What are the institutional mechanisms to, to warn the complainer not to do so? The closest case that I know about uh, was of a PhD student who ended up being kicked out from the program. He couldn't finish the course he, he, signed, for, uh, he, he signed for during the process of complaining. It started difficult uh, mental health issues. I imagine the high number of students who don't complain in order to be able to just finish their degrees. That process can take over your whole life and energy. Yes, I'm, I'm, I think that's exactly the, the most important um, way of reflecting on the cost of complaint is to reflect on actually what it means for one's ability to, to complete the degree or the program that, mm -hmm. that, that you signed up for. Uh, many people are warned. You, usually at the, in the complaint, at least in the UK, the first part of the complaint process is an informal complaint. Mm -hmm. So you would take the complaint to um, a supervisor or a member of the department. And that is usually where the warnings happen. You are warned against proceeding because proceeding of a complaint is, is, is you are told, would compromise your ability to finish your degree or because you'll become known as a complainer and that will be bad for you in terms of acquiring a reputation and so on and so forth. It's the most consistent early commentary to the student complainers or academic complainers. Um, the most consistent commentary is in the form of a warning. Um, and it's been right through my data how, 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 how frequent and how, how common that is, even warnings during and warnings after complaint 
the mm -hmm. warnings are, are telling us something about the risks and the dangers involved. But there are also obviously techniques for dissuading people from, from pursuing um, a complaint about problems that might compromise their ability to mm -hmm. finish their degree in the first place. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't have percentages because this is not the, that kind of project. This is a qualitative study that's based on bringing together close engagement with the stories of complaint that I've gathered here. But my, certainly my impression is that, that many who do complain end up having to leave that particular program. In fact, quite a few students I spoke to who complained only complained when they knew they had another program to go to, particularly in the case of PhD students. Um, so that they, that tells you something about what complaints can do, that people feel they have, have to have an alternative before they can even make it, because they know that actually a complaint can threaten the relationships that you have that you need to actually stay somewhere on a particular program. But also many of the academics um, who make complaints uh, end up leaving. And that's partly because a complaint can lead to an escalation of the very structural problems that you're trying to redress through the complaint in the first place, mm -hmm. but also because compl making a complaint can actually damage so many of the kind of relationships that you have with, with colleagues, with the institution, relationships of trust and so on. Um, so the, 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 a lot of the data that you have here comes from people who've ended up in quite a direct confrontation with the institution to get the complaint through or to get the complaint forward. So not all complaints end up in that direct confrontation but I think we can still learn from those complaints that do. Uh, I would also want to say as well that some of the academics I spoke to in particular, but also some of the PhD students have stressed that they thought we also needed to, to, to recognise the cost of not complaining, that there are many people who leave programmes because they can't complain, but nor can they stay in those programmes with the problems that they're experiencing being unaddressed. And, and those departures are departures that leave no trace. Mm -hmm. So I think that's also very, very important to remember because otherwise it might seem that one way of handling something is simply mm -hmm. to withdraw a complaint, not to pursue that level of action. But that form of handling something mm -hmm. is also what keeps something going. And that's why most of the students I know who've managed to stay on the program whilst complaining have done so by working as collectives, mm -hmm. working collectively with a group of students and sometimes also students and academics together in order to try and confront an institution because if they leave the problems they're experiencing unconfronted, they will leave. That was my answer to the question. Okay, um, the next question is from Tori Lane. To the part about finding what policies are actual policies and which ones aren't, a really interesting issue. What about the situations where there is no policy? I have recently discovered that at my institution, there is actually no policy in the faculty handbook that holds faculty to any standards in how to advise graduate students. The only thing in there about not abusing the inherent power imbalance between faculty and graduate students is basically don't have sex with students. Nor is there any avenue for graduate students to add to the conversation regarding a faculty member's effectiveness as an advisor director. I can only imagine this is intentional within the system, but the powerlessness from a graduate student's positionality is baffling. Yeah, I mean, this is a very good question. It was, it was almost unexpected, um, I would say, how much listening to complaint would lead me to really reflect again on the non-performativity of policy. Mm -hmm. Policies that don't do anything or at least don't bring into effect what they claim to do. And um, it, it was really, really, really uh, it was really surprised. And when you think about it, of course, many who make complaints reference the policies that do exist. I will come to those that don't uh, in their complaints. And they usually reference the policies that exist in order to point to their failure to be followed. Mm -hmm. So in fact, a lot of particularly academics who complain make reference to these policies in their complaints to, in, in, in effect, as evidence of what is not being done. Mm -hmm. But even using the failure to follow policy as evidence doesn't guarantee your success. And it's actually led me to realise what, what non-performativity means in terms of power. So one academic who was, it was not a straightforward complaint, but she ended up in a, in a kind of a, a power struggle with, with, with senior management. And she had evidence 
that they were failing to follow their own policies and procedures. But that she had evidence was almost treated as evidence of her being insubordinate mm -hmm. because she was implying to them that they should be that they should be subject to principles that were other than their own will, which of course they should be. But saying that they should be was in a way trying to make the policies mean something. And that was seen as insubordinate. So you realize then that the power can be the power to suspend the policies that are supposed to govern institutions, which, which, which gets, gets you to why complaint is so complicated because you're dealing with policies and procedures that can be quickly and easily suspended in order to determine the nature of the game or in order to determine the continuation of a pattern or a past or a history. So then what do you do then when there aren't any policy? or when the policies are just insufficient. One of the things that's really interesting from, from our conversations with academics is how many of those who make complaints end up being diversity workers, complaint as diversity work sort of literalizes. For example, one, one trans academic uh, in making a complaint about their failure to get a promotion realized that the institution didn't have a policy on trans equality. So, uh, he took on a new role as writing that policy. So the absence of a policy leads you to have to then become um, the person who not just modifies the tools, but introduces new, new tools that you would need then to actually do the work or make the complaint that you need. So the complaint becomes all the more work because you end up having to work on the institution in which you're making the complaint. Um, but the absence of a policy that, work, that, that, that defines what the values are can be very, very important. I mean, a, lot, a lot of people very, uh, have said to me things like, well, what, what does it mean to be helping institutions to have new policies if they can just suspend them or if they can just use them as evidence of what is being done? And I think that's a really, really complicated question. But I still think, nevertheless, that having policies that address questions of power are really central for those who are by virtue of position precarious in the institution. And where I worked, there was a policy on conflict of interest, which was actually really problematic because it basically said, staff and students can have relationships with each other. We don't wanna know about it. We trust that you're gonna do it well. And students actually looked to that policy and, and realized or thought that it that then endorsed the kind of behavior or the conduct that they wanted to name and identify as sexual misconduct. So actually having a policy that doesn't say, no, that's not acceptable. We want to know that and that's not acceptable. It does, it is what enables that conduct to be continued because you have no means to challenge it. So the, a better policy wouldn't have created a new culture in which that, in which that conduct didn't happen, but it would give you a means to challenge the reproduction of the culture in which that conduct happened. That difference really matters, the difference that I just articulated there. So, so, so to policy work really matters to diversity work only if we think of the policy as one means of addressing these power relationships within institutions. If it becomes an end, then a policy can become another way in which the institution can appear to have dealt with something. That's a long answer, I hope it's okay. <laughs> Um, next question um, is um, from Carissa Barrera. Sara, thank you for your powerful work and for sharing your work with all of us. My question is this, for those of us who look to higher education to better ourselves and those around us, how can we find the balance of resisting these institutions when we look to them to receive an education? I am familiar with resisting in place, but I am conflicted. Yeah. I think this is a good question. Um, balance, I was never very, very good at balance. <laughs> I think it's a queer thing, like balance always it sounds like, like, you know, uh, I, my, my relationship to institutions was always very unbalanced, I suspect. But I think this idea that um, we need to think about resistance not being what overwhelms our relationship to the institution, because actually we're still going there for something. And, you know, I'm partly doing this work, having left the universities, I'm no longer employed by a university, yet I'm still writing and speaking and thinking about complaints at universities. That's telling you something. That tells you something that I still care about universities as environments and institutions. I care in part because I recognise that universities hold many histories of learning and that universities are one place to go to have access to those histories of learning, not the only place but one place and that's for me it really matters that these 
institutions like others uh, are as inclusive as possible, as open as possible. And these histories that I'm describing are occupying and um, they're making it impossible for some people to access knowledge. And that's, 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 that's a crisis that ought to be understood as a crisis. So, so um, to me, thinking about the resistance, I mean, the resistance comes because the institutions that we're looking to we are unable to receive from them the education that we're expecting. And, and all of the stories of harassment that I've been sharing with you, and I obviously heard many more and, and listened to many more than I could share with you, are about access. Like, it's not a question of do I or don't I resist? It's like, unless you address that problem, the way your supervisor is behaving to you or abusive behavior in the department that you're in, you, you, you can't receive something. So resistance isn't always like a volitional question of should I do it or how much? It's a question of often, I think, necessity in order to receive something from the institution. I have to, I have to get a no out. I have to say no. I have to find a way of stopping this behaviour. And I've, I've described complaint as non-reproductive labour. It is a work you have to do to stop an inheritance. And that inheritance has to be stopped because it, it's stopping you mm -hmm. from, from being able to be the student or be a lecturer or whatever it is that you're there to be. And many of the people who've, who've talked to me about making complaints and doing that work, which is a lot of work, have often said they're doing it because they, they, they want other people not to have to go through what they went through. So, you, so, so it's really about stopping. The complainer is often pathologized as having a will to power, but really what's at stake is just wanting to, the behavior, the conduct, which becomes sedimented, that becomes part of the institution, to stop and to do that you have to become inventive but you still need to be able to thrive and and study and, and and a lot of complaints are made in order to do the work you want and then the complaint takes you away from the work that you want to do and it's that loop and that paradox that is so difficult and I think really when I, I think about all the people I've spoken to that almost off almost all of the all of the kind of ways in which people make sense of how much they had to give up to make the complaint possible is also by narrating in terms of what they have um, found through complaint. And I, I described it in terms of finding other complainers, mm -hmm. finding out about other complaints. But there are also incredible stories of, of the kind of um, co collectivity and collegiality and alternative version of collegiality based on going through something that is so difficult. So it's not about, I'm gonna resist such and such time. And then after that, I'm gonna go back to my work. It's more thinking, well, well in the labor of saying no, to these forms of violence, I'm going to find what I need to enable me to to, to live and to be in these institutions in as in in, in in as a sort of full way as possible to not be as diminished as I might otherwise have been. And I think the collectivity of complaint is, is an overwhelming part of the data mm -hmm. is really what matters and what creates the possibility of of, of surviving the institutions we are trying to, to transform. Thank you for your question. Um, next question, Soumya Dasgupta. Thank you so much for this talk. I am enthralled by your use of architectural metaphors, such as doors, windows, blinds, corridors, inside, outside, over there, in here, to talk about the spaces and movements of violence and complaint. As a student of architecture, I was wondering what inspired or motivated you to use such similitudes. It seems to me that you are making drawing or drawings that explain architectures of violence and complaint as situated within the institutional space. It would be great if you can comment on that. That's a, a, a very good question and you're right uh, at the extent uh, of the architectural metaphors. Um, they are everywhere in this material. And I think that's telling us something. I mean, I, it's partly what's going on here. It's, it's about what I'm picking up. You know, whenever you're doing qualitative research, and I'm not a qualitative researcher by training, I'm actually a humanities uh, person by training, so I was used to working with texts and rather than talking to people. Um, but that I'm a humanities trained scholar probably really shapes how I'm relating to the data. So people have been talking to me or been writing to me and in a way, what's really, really important for me to say is that the doors and the windows and the blinds and the corridors are in the lecture because they're in what people are saying. 
in describing their experiences of complaint. So I'm noticing that they're noticing the doors. Mm -hmm. It's really, really important. So it's, it's not that I'm putting the doors in there. It's that I'm, I, 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 I can hear that the doors are there. And, and it, it's quite interesting because I was doing this project alongside writing the book on, on use. What's the use, the uses of use. And in that book, I was, um, I didn't originally have doors as one of my examples. But because I was writing about objects and how they get used and who use them, so this was a book in a way that was very much in dialogue with architecture and design, because I, I was hearing these stories about complaint and I was noticing how often people talked about doors, that I then put doors into my use book and talked about usable and unusable doors with reference to critical disability studies primarily. So I think that's really, really interesting in, in when we're thinking about research, like what do you notice and what do you pick up? And in a way, what I was trying to say is that, that the doors are there, the, the windows, the blinds that come down, the narrow corridors are there, that, that they are there is telling us something about the nature of the experience of complaint. Mm -hmm. And in a way, how complaint is a kind of, I call it a phenomenology of the institution. Mm -hmm. So much that is there that's part of the institution comes to the front, comes to the foreground, because you're trying to get a complaint through. So the doors are already there, the, the lock was already difficult to use. But when you're trying to get out, you have to, you have to get out because you're under threat. That difficult to use lock, lock matters even more. Uh, so what comes to the, the front of your consciousness is what makes it difficult to proceed. And a lot of the stories of complaint are the stories of being stopped from proceeding. And that's when the, the architectural metaphors are partly telling us that, that those stoppages become built into the institution or they're somewhere between an institution and a body, the lock in the hand, the lock in the hand, you know, mm -hmm. that entanglement in her description. So I think that's what I want to really stress is that it tells us something about what complaint is telling us about. I've called it as well a kind of queer phenology of the institution because so many of the experiences of, of complaint are quite queer. Uh, things aren't happen as they don't happen as they're supposed to happen. Words that are used everywhere by people who talk to me are odd, surreal, strange, disorientating, nothing lines up, nothing makes sense. So it, you really apprehend everything that's around you. And the other thing that's really important to say then is that it's not just like the, the space is occupied. Um, like it's not just, it is about the walls and the histories that they tell. It is about the doors and what they could say, but it's also about how histories can take up spaces too. That's why I use the letters in the box to really try and to, to make the metaphor more material. Like there's literally letters that take up space. So some, sometimes rooms can be occupied by histories that make it possible for some to be in the space whilst others are occupying that space by being. So there's so many stories of, of in the data, some of which I haven't shared today, about how um, harassment and bullying can actually become the material in the room that stops you being able to breathe. And so when, when you can't breathe, when you can't be or nest or breathe, the room matters even more. You become even more conscious of what surrounds you, the tightness of it, the, the difficulty of it. So I think that's where, where the architecture really matters. It actually matters as a measure of the difficulty of being in space. <laughs> um, Quan Lo, how do you suggest someone outside of the institutions to witness complaints? Outside of the institution. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to understand. Um, well, I think, you know, it's hard, well, what it, it, I, I want to give it a complexity in my understanding of what counts as the institution. So the many different histories that make the university an institution, something that has um, a building and a physical space, but also a kind of um, a set of traditions, a set of self-definitions, a brand, a, a group of students, a group of faculty, a group of people who are there thinking of themselves as part of that institution. Like it's a very complex entanglement. Um, and, you know, so, this project is, is, is about complaints at universities, partly because I come, I'm, I'm coming out of my own experience of having been in a university for like many years. And universities were a place I could go to so I could access people. I knew about that institution and enabled me to think about um, complaints with a level of um, depth and density I wouldn't have got if I had gone into another institution. But many of these institutions, they're not apart from a broader social world. I mean, they're from the broader social world. We are 
socially located and socially positioned so so in a way it's like even hard to say what would outside the institution be because the institution exceeds any any bounded sort of sort of definition but i do think that in a way a lot of um a lot of complaint i call it complaint activism where people actually use complaints formal complaints to press against institutions to make demands on their time a lot of complaint activism occurs partly because formal procedures and processes can bury complaints as i've been describing in mm -hmm. those filing cabinets no one knows about them and in a way a lot of the effort to get the complaint out involves working with people who are not in the institution like mm -hmm. using social media for instance or just using broader campaigns within publics to get to get the uh, the story out there so that other people can find out this happened this happened here as uh, quite a few people have sort of spoken to me about how they would be surprised by some of the stories that I've shared because they expected universities to be relatively progressive spaces and to have you know developed diversity policies that enabled certain issues to be addressed like maybe better than other institutions so so in a way like um it's very, very important for us to have conversations across institutions and to recognize that some of the things that go on in this institution with its histories can 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 bear resemblances or be connected to what goes on in other institutions and so it's, it's useful to think of the complaint activism as about mobilizing a wider witnessing public this does go on what do we do when this does go on um, next question is from Silvana Tapia. Positioning such a critical artistic and alternative academic discourse is difficult when, as an early career scholar, one is struggling to secure a job. Being attractive in the market often means being traditional, doctrinal, black letter, etc. What do we do to make our need to disguise ourselves to survive? How do we navigate, for instance, a job interview? <laughs> oh, these are really good questions. I don't know if I'm the right person to answer, especially <laughs> the last one. Um, you know, this is so hard. This is really, really, really challenging. There's, without question, in a lot of the people who I talked to, I, 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 get, had, I interviewed 40 people, staff, uh, academics and students. A lot of people I talked to reflected on the way in which it, in their earlier part of their careers or because they were students now they, they didn't feel able to express themselves uh, as they would like to because that would compromise the trajectory mm -hmm. and i think it's really important for me to say that that in a way the warnings uh, about complaint the danger of complaint are not separate from the wider cluster of speech acts that we get we call career advice mm -hmm. that tell you what you need to do to maximize your chances of progression and one of the kind of findings but it's not really a finding it's just like <laughs> but one, one, of the, one of the arguments of the book is that what you are told you need to do to progress within the institution is what reproduces the institution mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i just think that's true at a certain level and i think we all know that but what to do about that because in a way what we want is to change that such that those who are entering the institution across multiple different pathways do not have to get narrowed down, do not have to remove themselves from their own lives and their own work in order to get somewhere. And we want that because that's the way the institution is going to change by no longer having such a narrowing down of what it takes to go somewhere or to proceed faster in a direction that you want to go. Um, and I think, you know, part of building out alternative programs is about trying to counter that narrowing down of what scholarship is, is about saying that actually you know, doing certain kinds of institutional work um, should be credentializing. Mm -hmm. You should be able to, and, and in a way, kind of diversity, however much we might problematize the uh, diversity and equality initiatives, there's a way in which we can use them as screens as, to make writing a diversity statement is like a really annoying thing to have to do because you know how non-performative it is. But at another level, you can almost slip yourself in there a little way, in a way that you might not be able to if you didn't have a diversity statement. So it can make you think about the ways in which you want to change the institution. It can make you imagine or write that script in a way that allows you into the institution. So I think we have to be quite strategic about getting people in who have that level of political consciousness about what they don't want to reproduce 
um, and that does involve a little bit of disguise or a little bit of passing. I mean, we all have different entries and different trajectories, and you know, it is important to know as well that is people do become institutional killjoys without losing their jobs. It is possible. Um, it is possible to, and, and also the probably the, the danger is that you, you, you're supposed to. Um, make disappear the more obviously confrontational aspects of your political genealogy but it, we all know that it's risky because actually by the time you get tenure in in, in, the, in your language or the time you become a full professor or whatever it is that disappearance can become the case like it's, it's hard to then get back that kind of political energy so I'm, I'm mumbling a lot now because I'm really not quite sure exactly how to answer it other than to say that I think as feminist academics it is our responsibility to enable more to enter the institution whilst giving less of themselves up. Thank you. Um, Ashley McDonald. In my experience, it's the fact that they make it feel like you're being punished for complaining through bureaucracy, like meetings, paperwork, and intimidation through processes. Did you notice tons of patterns and themes around that in your research. Yeah. I mean, you might have seen that even that one quote that I gave you about all these different channels of complaint and you have to speak to this group and that group and they're not speaking to each other. So the complex sort of administrative system that you have to enter is also how complaints end up being lost, how you end up being lost. And it's a kind of overwhelm, overwhelm, um, overwhelming amount of paperwork. That, that is required. One, one student described how they became their own administrator. They had to administer their own complaints process. They had to make sure that that file got from that person to that person because otherwise it wouldn't get there. Mm -hmm. I've also sometimes called this strategic inefficiency, like the, um, the, 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 the slow and laborious nature of the administration of the complaint is kind of like intended. I'm going to say it, it's intended to wear you down, to wear you out so that you will retire the complaint. So that it's just it just takes too much out of you, and it, it's an absolute theme uh, across much of my material that people are quite aware that that's what institutions are doing. That they're trying to sort of exhaust you <laughs> into no longer taking it through and taking it forward. There's also different tactics they use, and in the second chapter of the book is called "On Being Stopped," and I'm, I just list the different tactics. So warnings is one of them, nods and assurances and yeses is another, and strategic inefficiency is another. And I think um. In, in a way, um, what I've learned is it, it, it can be, for example, the institution takes, it doesn't follow its own procedures in terms of timelines. So a lot of, a lot of people talk about, oh, these would kept, uh, they're supposed to take three months. And then there was six months and they still hadn't, I still hadn't received anything. So you have to push. So when they don't uh, meet their own deadlines, timelines, you're the one who has to push, 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 push. And if you don't push, it doesn't go anywhere. And also, if you don't push, you might not actually make their procedures because their procedures still say the complaint has to be dealt with in such such length of time. So there's actually a, a mechanics to how some complaints get stopped. Technically, you don't make the complaint because the institution doesn't do it fast enough in terms of its own procedures. Other things that have come up are um, making up your own deadlines. This has come up in a number of complaints in the UK, I think this might be specific to the UK, um, where like they'll suddenly pull out of their air. Oh, you need to respond to this by the X date. And they're giving you no warning that that's the case. So there's kind of like, it's kind of like the bumbling, the kind of bumbling along, making it up as they go along is one expression from one of my interviews. And, and then they just, they just catch you out. Um, so it's just timing and inefficiency and the need to go through complex bureaucratic processes. These are all very, very important mechanisms which make the complaint harder to keep going and I think um, the first part of the book is sort of describing the institutional mechanics of that like how institutions work through stopping complaints about how they work and the um, second part the, the last part of the book the third part of the book if these also can talk is, is trying to explain that like what is going on here what do we learn about power if the institution is trying to actually block the very complaints it says that it is um, willing to hear through various policies and procedures. Um, the next question is from Sandra Ruiz. Thank you, Professor Ahmed. You're a force of light led by integrity and brilliance. I'm honored to be in your presence today. How can we make your talk or work an act of, of deliberate labor 
the template analytic format for all university ethics trainings? Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, ethics trainings, yeah. Um, the first, I think it, it does get some, I, I've heard, I've heard uh, unofficially <laughs> that on being included does get used in diversity training. I'm kind of ambivalent about that. <laughs> um, you know, I think what I would say is is is, is this is, is who I'm writing this work for. You know, I'm I would be very um, pleased if the work could be taken up within institutions to throw light on some of these processes that are all the more difficult because they happen in such a privatized way. Like uh, I think a lot of the you know privatization, whether it's in the family or in the university, can make you feel really alone. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just sometimes it's just really helpful. To hear, to hear the mechanics of what goes on and to know that your story is part of a bigger story. So, so if, if, if my work can be helpful um, to people who are surviving institutions, then that would be good. I, I, I doubt very much it can, be, it can be part of the training provision, or whether it's ethics training or, or diversity training. I would say as well that, you know, I've, I've always been very clear about who I'm writing for, like before this project even, um, I've never really written for kind of senior managers, even though senior managers have been at some of my talks on complaint. I, want, I once had a, a gave a talk on a complaint, which was funded by a cent centrally by Eddie University, and there were senior managers at the front, and I was talking about nodding as a non-performative, and they were all nodding. <laughs> it was really quite funny, because I'm like, you're nodding about my nodding as a non-performative, <laughs> but the, the noddings of your nodding is not non-performative. Like, what's going on here? And students came up to me afterwards and said, Sarah, you know, look, what you were saying is exactly what's been happening in our institutions to us to our complaint right now. And okay. they're the senior managers that are involved in that. And they're nodding. And I'm like, yes, they're nodding. Mm -hmm. And in a way, you know, I'm writing to the students behind those senior managers. I'm writing to the students who can hear what those nods are being used not to do. And that's who I'm writing for. So um, if that lets the work get into training for universities, so be it. But 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 really, I, I think probably I prefer it to be read, you know, in like, Feminist culture reading groups. <laughs> That's more the obvious home for this kind of work. And this work, which is coming, you know, I'm the author, but it comes out of a collective. There's a lot of stories and a lot of people who are part of this work. And I think I think we would find ourselves more comfortable in, in Kiljo reading groups of various kinds. <laughs> um, Kristen Romberg, the next question. How do you see your work here relating to Sarah Shulman's conflict is not abuse? Yeah, um, I don't know Sarah Shulman's work, Conflict is Not Abuse, particularly well. But I, I would say, if anything, just, just thinking of the title, Conflict is Not Abuse, I think I would say that my work might be the reverse. It would be a lot about how, about, about how abuse is not conflict. Because I think the, uh, I mean, let me just say the reverse is necessarily an opposed argument. It's just, it's just taking the other side of, of the problem. Because actually one of the really striking features, particularly of um, complaints about harassment and bullying, is how often harassment and bullying is treated as, as just a conflict of view. <laughs> These are two conflicting parties and they have two different views about something. And we should just sit down and talk about it. And, and institutions use mediation, rather like governments use reconciliation. They imply that there's a conflict that can be resolved by better communication, where usually actually the person who has been harmed is the one who has to accept some sort of weak non-performative apology and then we can move on. And I think that that, that, that the understanding of uh, abuse and um, abuses of power as conflicts of opinion is incredibly damaging. And I've seen it happen all, all across my data in all different sorts of conflict, race, racial harassment, sexual harassment, understood as two different people with two different points of view and we need to hear them together. And in some cases, institutions are refusing to come down on harassment because they see it as taking sides. I think one, one manager actually used that language. We don't want to take sides. So one student was, was, was basically really threatening the violence another student. And they're like, no, we don't want to take sides. And not taking sides in a situation of harassment is taking sides. It's taking the side of the harasser. So I would say that if there, if there was a connection, it would just be that my interest is much more in how abuses of power are minimized or not recognized by being treated as conflict. The next question. Thank you so much for the talk. It was really brilliant and inspiring. My question is that you talked about how complaints are structured. I was wondering if we can talk about the same structure when student to student complaint is the case. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think one of my opening 
remarks was that this project is not about all complaints or any complaints. It is about complaints that address abuses of power, such as harassment and bullying, or also complaints that um, address inequalities or workplace um, uh, in, injustices of, of some kind. So that, that immediately is a limitation of the scope of the work. It's about these complaints, mm -hmm. these complaints that I have gathered and I'm trying to hear. I use the language of truth a lot more in this work than at any other time, because it, it just, it just it seems like the right language. There is truth in these complaints that is to hear that truth is to change how we view the institution. That's a, that's a very simple way of, of counting or describing my own method. And there's without, without doubt a way in which I'm thinking of structures and patterns and repetitions in how complaints work. But what's interesting is that some of those structures are quite consistent. So um, it might be that you make a complaint about uh, unreasonable accommodations as a disabled student or a member of, of academic and some of the things that you come up against including the attempt to chip away at your own testimony rendering you the suspect uh, are very similar <laughs> to some of what happens when you make a complaint about a person-to-person -person harassment say mm -hmm. so th there's something there that like the effort to address a problem that the institution in some way doesn't want dealt with can lead to similar sorts of experiences. So we're learning something about how power works that, that seemingly different situations can end up with similar um, sets of encounters. And I've even noticed that, for example, I, I, I did uh, one of the really uh, complaints that I really um, focus on quite a lot is by a group of students who made a complaint about the conduct of other students. And so it wasn't a, a complaint students making a complaint about academics which you know is, is possibly the more expected uh, way in which the power relation would fall and what was really striking in in that instance is that it was it was four women students making a complaint about two men students who were sexually harassing them through verbal harassment mainly talking about milking bitches really nasty sort of sexist speech and then they became very threatening when the, when the students made an informal complaint and what was really striking to me was just how the 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 the, 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 the students who, who were harassing the other students were, were protected in a similar way to some of the professors in my data have been protected and it's almost like those students were seen as promising like they they, they were going to they were going to reproduce the institution much more effectively and 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 so the, the the women students who were complaining about their behavior became policed and treated almost like naughty naughty girls who had to be disciplined and they were enabled and i think that's partly to do with like who is deemed to have more um more likelihood of reproducing what the institution imagines it to be so even between students those same power relations can manifest in terms of who gets protected and who doesn't and so the structures are uh, can be consistent even when you're dealing with what appears to be quite different sets of arrangements and that in itself is telling us something about structures i think um the questions there are a lot of them so we're going to just keep going <laughs> um we have another uh well about 15 minutes are you okay sarah i'm i'm fine thank you all right let's keep going then um ellie harwood do you think that institutional complaint processes can ever lead to justice for the complainant i'm not sure i have ever seen it happen in practice it's a very good question and i'm not sure i have either having talked to a lot of people i think it depends what you mean for justice i, I remember talking to one uh, early career academic who made a complaint that was about bullying and harassment at her former institution and she i, I learned a lot from her interview she talked about how she started out as a complainer you know somebody who was really willing to complain and then over time became a little warier about what it meant to do that work so it was quite different to some of the people who talked to me about starting off feeling that they were too precarious, too precariously situated to complain and then acquiring more of a desire to complain once they become more secure. Her, her narrative was different, but she said to me, you know, she was really glad that her complaint didn't work. So she didn't get justice. I don't know. So why am I talking about her? She didn't get justice. She said to me once and it, re it really, really stuck with me. She said, you know, I, I really believe in complaining even when you don't get somewhere, not because I believe in justice, but just because I believe like, it's worth it fighting for accountability and also because I have a record like I put it all together and that record then is is an evidence that I tried that I had a go I think she used that expression I had a go 
Um, and so there, there is interestingly in the stories I've collected and in me, I can even hear it in my own voice when I'm talking about this material. Although there's so much violence and so much shattering, and to be honest, I have been shocked by some of people's experiences, the extent to which the university, the institution will use force on a complainer and, and how people's lives can break apart, not, not just their jobs, but their, but their lives. But that despite all of that, there's a huge amount of hope in the data, in, in my own experience as well, that there is a point. There's a point to this. And it's not necessarily that, that you will get justice from it. I think a lot of people go into a complaint and come out of a complaint in quite different places. Mm -hmm. And they don't necessarily come out of a sense of justice, but they come out of a sense of there is a point to trying. And the point is partly because you actually end up quite politicised by the whole process. You, 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 you come to a better awareness or understanding of, of how institutions work, of the reproductive mechanisms that enable worlds to be assembled around the same bodies doing the same old things. And so funnily enough, it's, it's not so much justice, it's more like a, almost like a clarity of a sense of political purpose that you get from complaint. And people do, things do change as a result of complaint. It might be you do, some, some complaints do lead to getting accommodations that you need to do your work, or some complaints might lead to the removal of somebody who is involved, who is harassing you or bullying you. Um, but I think really when people talk about kind of words like justice or they're not actually necessarily talking about that kind of material reconfiguration of the work environment. They're talking more about the kind of political energy and how it distributes itself uh, as a change consciousness, a change relationship to the institution and to people. Because I, almost everyone I spoke to who, who came to me, and obviously not everyone's going to come to me, so people who are coming to me has, has said that, you know, they, they rarely found their people. <laughs> free complaint they found the people that mattered to them and i think that's if that's going to be if there's any image of justice it's the it's the people that you find they're the image of justice that's beautiful <laughs> um um next um is from i think Deepthi mystery um love you sarah i'm oh, observing <laughs> I'm observing these same dynamics in an avowedly anti-racist women and gender studies department. I'd love to hear your thoughts on mediation processes. Our department was put through mediation, which as you mentioned, may be escalating the issue. Do mediations ever work in your observation? What kind of restorative justice is possible in such circumstances? Right. Well, I think it's really that your, your opening sentence is really important because I think uh, a lot of these dynamics, um, let's just call it, call it these abuses of power and how they get institutionalized, happen in environments and, and spaces that might be explicitly, avowedly feminist and anti-racist, critical spaces. Uh, and in fact, these spaces, it, it can be even harder to challenge those kinds of patterns because there's an expectation that those problems aren't there or it might be that people's investments in the programs become blockages to dealing with the problem because if the program's precarious, perhaps people don't feel they can actually address the problem without threatening the program. And there's all sorts of weird uh, conduct that goes around there. And there's quite a lot of the, uh, you know, the silencing of the complaint by which I mean not necessarily stopping the complaint from being made, but stopping anyone from speaking publicly about the complaint. A lot of the stories of silencing have been in relationship to other feminists and other feminist academics or students and i think I've, i'm trying to explain that dynamic as well like what why is that or how is that um uh, it might be that uh what, what, when one student for example talked about how like she's in a very, very critical department and the department was really good at being critical of other institutions or broader dynamics or structures but as soon as the criticism was here at home it was be silent 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 because uh, almost as if that there, there's a kind of like desire to protect where you are or the institution that you're in, including the understanding the feminism program you have is somehow bound up with the institution. So its longevity depends upon not complaining about the institution in any public way. And it's incredibly hard when feminists are silenced by feminists and disciplined by the feminists for complaining too loudly. And that certainly happened to me and that certainly happened to a lot of people I've spoken to. So I, I would just want to start with that sentence. You know, I'm, I, I don't, I, the, the, the data that I have, I'm reflecting on the material that I has been shared with me and the stories that I have been given about mediation have all been about the total misuse of mediation as a technique for managing the problem. And by managing, I mean managing it away, turning it, treating it as something 
that is that can be dealt with through through conversation. I'm gonna one in one case where a woman who was bullied was invited to a hotel room by a mediated company as appointed to sit down with the bully and and chat. I mean, she just she didn't go. I mean, she was just shocked that they even thought that would be the case. Now, I'm sure there is good practice in mediation. Those stories are not in my my, my data. I, I I do feel that. Um, restorative justice you know I, one of the things i think is really important is that a lot of the um pathologizing of the complainer i've described some of that here um the complainer gets treated as sort of malicious or as a stranger not really from here doesn't have our values and so on and so forth but an, another way that the stranger is positioned is positioned by being positioned as as destructive uh, but also um using critical language, almost like a carceral feminist. It's come up over and over again in my data that the person who makes the complaint, say about uh, sexual harassment or bullying from an academic, is kind of a carceral feminist as if they're kind of like the police or the prison guards. And the implication is, is that the, you make the complaint because you want to punish and to persecute the person who harassed you. So that, that is a total mythology. Most people who make complaints, they don't want punish or persecute, they don't want prisons involved. They just want the behavior to stop. So what's going on there is that the desire to stop the behavior, to stop the uh, use of the power to enable someone to do what they want, that in itself is understood as kind of punishing. And one of the really things I've really noticed is that when when people do pursue formal complaints, it's particularly the case in radical, so-called radical departments, where people self-understand or self-describe as radicals or progressives. So maybe they're subversive intellectuals. They think their policies are police and so on and so forth. So they might say complaints are part of neoliberalism. We are, we are imposed like a, like a regime upon radical academics, stopping them expressing themselves freely. Well, one of the things I've noticed is that the use then of restorative justice. So the implication being like, oh, um, rather than complain, you should have just been interested in restorative justice. And, and really that's a misuse of the language of restorative justice, <laughs> almost to imply again, that the, the conduct, the, the, the harassment and the bullying is something that can be sort of um, resolved through through mediation as if, it, as if it's something that is just about communicating poorly rather than about fundamentally an abuse of power. So restorative justice can be used a little bit again like reconciliation. It can be used to imply that the problem is simply a failure to be of harmony and that the solution is restoration. Well if you, if you make re restoration the solution the problem has not been dealt with. So that's why I think of complaint as another way of dealing with that problem but that work of trying to stop harassment is not just about destruction, not at all. It might look like that to those who are invested in those behaviors. Actually, it's about building an alternative community. And that's where restoration or thinking about, you know, other kinds of abolitionist projects is actually much more kinship with that than it might appear at first. Because you're saying, you're thinking about how to have accountability, how to deprive people of the power that they use to in order to manage the institution in the way that they do and build therefore relationships and connections that actually are about enabling people to enter and be in those institutions as safely as they can enter and be. So I think it's a very, I guess I'm so aware of the misuse of some of the, the languages of restorative justice, the languages of cultural feminism, that I'm very, very cautious myself about identifying my work in relationship to those words, but those words do matter somewhere else further along the line. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Um, maybe we can take one last question because we, you must be exhausted. It's been two hours almost. So one last question. Um, I so appreciate this work and Ahmed's sensitivity and nuance. One of the issues I wonder about with concerns like this is an embedded assumption about truth, that of the complainers, which while we might want to believe every registered complaint, can we also acknowledge that there are those who strategically use complaints for other purposes, some of which might not be true? For example, those deployed against faculty of color or queer faculty as a retaliatory move against our authority. Yeah, no, I think that's very important. And when I, when I, when I mean, when I say the truth in this material, the truth in the data, the truth that is behind lock and key, you know, I was trying to think of the, the doors of consciousness that shut violence out can be the same doors as the doors of the institution that shut violence in. When I'm thinking about truth, I'm thinking about what gets shut in, that there's something shut in that 
really that's why now at this moment in my intellectual career I'm willing to talk about the truth because it, it's going to take the truth to get it out that's 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 what I'm saying I'm not saying that every complaint is therefore truth or that every every complainer has to be assumed to be right or just or have justice in mind I already have given one example of somebody who made a complaint only to have a counter complaint made against them so here complaint can be weaponized against the complainer used as a as a, as a as a technique for getting one's way and there are without question examples like that in my material where the complaint becomes an institutional resource that can be used to discipline people the difficulty is is that many who have complaints brought against them where the complaint has truth in it and i can hear the truth understand themselves or describe themselves or represent themselves as being the object of retaliation. Um, and so I mentioned the an instance where an academic man who had uh, multiple, at least 10 students who'd made complaint, including really serious allegations of rape and domestic violence and assault, who, um, who, who publicly represented himself as, as being disciplined because he was a, a Marxist uh, and uni, a Marxist, basically a, a Marxist um, academic and intellectual so that that was convincing to people because they are con people are convinced that actually institutions will come down on radicals because you hey we know it they do you know so there's already an understanding that retaliation like that can happen but but he was using that to conceal the fact that he was the one who was abusing power quite consistently and i think that's the difficulty is that how can you tell the difference between those who represent complaints about harassment as retaliation in order to conceal the harassment and those who who are themselves actually the objects of retaliation and when it's very very hard to unpack I, I know examples for instance where queer academics have, have have had complaints brought against them because of not expressing themselves in, in a way that was deemed appropriate so a, a heteronormative lens can be used to to regulate and, and decide what's acceptable and you become more vulnerable to complaint for not being acceptable i don't know, know of that but i also know where queer faculty have said that students who make complaints against them are motivated by homophobia whereas when i've looked at the material i don't think so actually they're using that accusation to disguise their own abuses of power i have examples of where academic men of color have said that actually student complaints about sexual harassment are motivated by racism i've looked at the material and sometimes it's actually students of color making complaints about racism so it's really really difficult to work out how power is working so power is really tricky complaints are sticky and power is really tricky and we need we need um thick description without any question but we we, we need you know really to be very careful because what happens i think I, i've used the story the wolf of child story a little bit in one of the chapters to, to describe it so that the idea that the complainer is in a way the arm you're trying to get up you're trying to get out and the institution keeps coming down on you but with the person you're complaining about will represent themselves as the arm as the ones who are being disciplined by the institution so then the complainer becomes perceived as the institution as a manager and it's incredibly hard to unpack the politics and the power involved in these dynamics so we just have to do our best to make sense of them and to be very, very careful. And that the reason that I've only very often, not, not very often dealt with the use of complaints as retaliation is because of, I just want to be very, very careful because I know that most people who have complaints against them represent themselves as, as, mm -hmm. as the victims of, of retaliation. And, and you just have to be very careful with that. Oh, I think we're going to have to stop there because there are many more questions than you're going to be able to answer. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> I should try and answer my questions more, more sh sh short. I've just been shorter answers next time. Um, well, thank you so much. It's been such a privilege to have had you here. And um, I think you've spoken to all our experiences in such kind of powerful and transformative ways. Um, thank you so much. Oh, um, thank you very much for inviting me here and for all your incredibly interesting, important questions. It has been such a privilege to do this work. I just want to, because I, I don't want to end on my note of caution about how re retaliation can be used as a, a way of not ad addressing an abuse of power. I, I also just want to say that um, although there was a, a lot of pain and difficulty in the material that I collected, that it's been an incredible privilege to bring these stories out to the world. And I feel really, really grateful for having been able to do that. It's something that uh, is, I think I'll always be 
carrying these complaints with me. And although sometimes it's heavy, like it's hard, um, at other times it just makes me feel so, uh, so glad to be part of a, a community fighting for justice and fighting for institutions so that they can be places that we go to learn. Okay, thank you everyone. And um, I think we'll have to end it here, however reluctantly <laughs> we do that. Um, so thank you and um, yes. Right.